I'm continuing my reading. What I'm doing in this series is to read through the entire standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This consists of the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. I am reading in a chronological order of events, not according to publication or volume, so I will be skipping around a little bit as I move along. Right now, I am turning back to First Chronicles, chapter 21, because it picks up, it is the same story that we read in 2 Samuel 24 in the last video that I did. It's the same story. Slightly different names to some of the characters, but the same story. And then we will continue in Second Chron- in First Chronicles as we finish out some of the rest of David's reign, and we it will then parallel First Kings. Let us read this, chapter 21. David sins by numbering Israel. The Lord sends pestilence upon the people. David sacrifices and the plague is stayed. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba, even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me, that I may know it. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Now, Note here, as I mentioned in my video, my reading of Samuel 24, that uh, it's Satan that moved David to do this, not God. And you'll also note that in Samuel, it actually kind of gives us a uh, itinerary of how Job traveled throughout the land of Israel to number the people. Here we're just told, he travels throughout the land and returns to Jerusalem. We're not told where he, how he traveled through. Just thought that was an interesting difference. Verse 5. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. And all they of Israel were a thousand, were a thousand thousand and an hundred thousand men that drew sword. And Judah was four hundred threescore ten thousand men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. Now that's interesting. Well, first of all, the numbers are somewhat different here. In Samuel it said uh, 800,000 for Israel and 500,000 for Judah. Here we have 1,000, 1,000. That's a million. Six zeros. And a hundred thousand men. So that's one million one hundred thousand for Israel. And then for Judah, four hundred, three score, and ten. That's four hundred and seventy thousand for a total of one and a half one million five hundred and seventy thousand. That's almost three hundred thousand more than was recorded in Second Samuel. So might refer you back to my video on large numbers in the Bible and the Old Testament might help out. But I find it interesting here that Joab did not include Levi or Benjamin. This is because the word was abominable to Joab. And like I said in my other video, it seems that David was planning a new military campaign. And Joab's like, this is not good. We, we shouldn't be doing this. And Joab's a man that likes power. He wants to be in his position in Israel. But he's still a patriot. He doesn't want his people destroyed. And he doesn't see anything good coming from this. And so he leaves out Levi, because they're the priests. They shouldn't be going to war anyways. And Benjamin, who is the smallest of the tribes, because if they do go to war, he doesn't. it seems to me that he doesn't want to risk 
destroying the tribe of Benjamin because this is, it's a bad move in the first place. So he's kind of trying to protect the two, let me say, the two most vulnerable tribes. Let us continue. Verse 7. And God was displeased with this, with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go, and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee, either three years famine, or three months to be destroyed before, the, before thy foes, well, that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what, what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are, the mercy, are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Now there are some some differences here that I would like to point out. Now it's still the same three basic uh, choices here. But in Second Samuel, it was seven years famine. Here it's only three. I think this is probably more accurate. Three years famine, three months war, or three days pestilence. The three is kind of unified. But in Samuel, David said the same thing, let me fall down into the hand of the Lord. But in Second Samuel, it didn't make a lot of sense there, because wouldn't all this be the hand of the Lord? But because it just said three days pestilence in the land. But this makes, it, this makes more sense. It says pestilence in the land and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout. So this is the one that is, we're sending the angel of the Lord to do this destruction. And that's why David says, let me fall into the hands of the Lord. And that's why it's the pestilence. So as I, in Second Samuel, when David says, let me fall into the hands of the Lord, it's kind of, do you mean famine or do you mean pestilence? Because those both be the hands of the Lord. And this one makes it clear that when he says the hands of the Lord, he means the pestilence. So I, I find that interesting. Uh, verse 14. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Now we got to pause here a moment. Uh, let's read one more verse. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. So there you go. This is the same basic. Then we have Ornan, and in Second Samuel it was Aruna. You know, similar names. We can just written in different time periods, you might say. I, I don't know. But there is something very interesting here. Now, one thing I didn't forget to mention, but this does have the Joseph Smith translation here. Well, the Joseph Smith translation is this is an inspired translation or correction of the Bible done by Joseph Smith to restore those passages that have been lost over the years. And in this chapter, what we just read, verses 15 and 16, we have a Joseph Smith translation. Now you remember this same passage, the same part of the story. Joseph Smith had to correct it in Second Samuel too, because Second Samuel also said that God repented, and God doesn't repent. So he says God repented of the evil. God doesn't do evil. He has no need to repent. So this is the Joseph Smith translation for six, fifteen and sixteen. Here it says, "And the angel stretched forth his hand unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And God said to the angel, Stay now thine hand; it is enough." For as he was destroying, the Lord beheld Israel, that he repented him of the evil. 
Therefore the Lord stayed the angel that destroyed as he stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Now Ornan was threshing wheat and his four sons with him. And Ornan turned back and saw the and saw the angel. Oh, sorry. I misread that. That's verse 20. But we have the same translation that it was the people repented. Specifically, David repented. That's why God called the angel off. It wasn't God repenting. It was the people and it was David. But yeah, sorry. I misread that, that last one. That's supposed to be verse 20. So let's, let's continue reading. Verse, verse 17. And David said unto God, It is not that I... Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I. Is it that <laughs> even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed? But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray, I pray thee, O Lord God, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. So we have David saying the same prayer he said in 2 Samuel. Now, verse 18. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of God, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him did, uh, hid themselves now Ornan was threshing wheat. So back to the Joseph Smith translation, the verse 20 here. Now Ornan was threshing wheat and his four sons with him. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel, and they hid themselves. Just kind of reordering the words, not a big change in meaning. But anyways, verse 21. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. That sh thou shalt grant it me for the full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give it thee, <laughs> or, lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering, I give it all. And King David said to Ornan, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. So David gave to Ornan for the place six hundred shekels of gold by weight. And David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord, and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, then he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses made in the wilderness, and the altar of the burnt offering, were at that season in the high place at Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid because of the sword of the angel of the Lord. Okay, that, there's a couple of interesting things here. First of all, in Second Samuel, he only paid 50 shekels. Here he's paying 200, and he's buying the entire place. So there's just a few discrepancies and details there, but I, I do like that ending there. I do like that ending. David, apparently... Didn't didn't actually offer the sacrifice. It says and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar. So, God's the one that lit the fire on the altar, and he said he was scared to go up to Gibeon because of the angel. He said he he made the he he made the sacrifice here because he was commanded to. Even though there was the altar, the, the tabernacle was there at Gibeah. He could have gone there to do his burnt offerings. But the angel, through Gad, told him that he needed to build an altar here and make the sacrifices here. And so he was afraid to go up to Gibeah. He said, no, i got to do it here. And this shows us that God accepts the sacrifices, in, not just in the tabernacle, not just in the temple. Again, evidence 
that there were other places that people could rightly do these ordinances. But we'll leave that here, and I'll see you in the next one.